Welcome to the City of Laguna Niguel's Virtual Veterans Day Ceremony on this 101st anniversary of honoring our veterans. I'm Laguna Niguel City Council Member Elaine Genoway, and I will be your guide throughout the program. Although we are virtual, we are absolutely delighted to have you join us today. We will begin with the presentation of the flags led by local Boy Scout troops 734, 772, 773, and 774, followed by Mayor Pro Tem Fred Minigar leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Next will be the national anthem sung by Girl Scout Katie Schaefer from Girl Scout Troop 2544. And finally, a moment of silence led by Dennis Mulvaney, Scout Liaison, member of American Legion Post 281, and a Korean War veteran. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Representatives from Boy Scout Troops 734 and 773 are our color guards today. Color guard attention, color guard advance. Color guard, host the colors. <coughs> Color guard, you're excused. The American flag is the most recognizable symbol on the planet and it is the greatest symbol of freedom here in our great city of Laguna Niguel and across the entire United States. It is important that the sacrifices made by our brave servicemen and women do not go unappreciated and that they are never forgotten. Without these sacrifices, our freedoms would not be what they are today. To show our appreciation and patriotism, Please stand and join me on this momentous day as we pay our respects by pledging allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For whom the bell tolls, join me in a moment of silence for all the men and women who have sacrificed their lives to give us our nation's freedom. Thank you. You may be seated. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we held At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight For the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that a flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the Thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Katie. Now, to welcome you, our mayor, Lori Davies, and a few words by council members John Mark Jennings and Sandy Raines. As the mayor of Laguna Niguel, I am truly honored and humbled to be here to pay tribute to our veterans and their families. These true American heroes are unselfishly placed their lives 
on the line for our freedoms, and we can never repay them for that. Veterans Day is a special day that honors all those who have served and currently serve in the United States military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard. As we gather here today, it is important to remember that there are countless members of our armed forces that are stationed at all corners of the world, all in an effort to protect this great country. They are serving at all hours, every weekday and weekend, and on every holiday of the year. They are missed by their families, friends, and loved ones back at home. We can show our gratitude by reaching out and expressing our appreciation, and by recognizing the impact that military service has had on all of our lives, which has led to the protection and the freedoms that we so cherish. Today, the Veterans Day, we come together as a community to say thank you to all veterans and their families for their past, present, and future sacrifices. To pay tribute, the City of Laguna Niguel has put together a number of programs that have served to highlight our veterans and to honor them in small but powerful and meaningful ways. One of these programs is the creation of a large military service member chalk wall outside of the Sea Country Senior and Community Center. This wall serves as a canvas for the community to compose thoughtful and thankful messages to our community of veterans and to create artwork that provides encouragement and praise. Knowing and displaying the names of the brave men and women who have made sacrifices to protect our country is an honor that this city is happy to engage in. To do this, the new Digital Veterans Salute Program was created to recognize Laguna Niguel veterans' military personnel. Family and friends and local veterans were given the opportunity to post inspiring messages to their loved ones, which are currently displayed on the city's website and social media pages, listing the veteran's name, military branch, and rank. These avenues of recognition from our Laguna Niguel community are simple yet meaningful acts that further signify the city's commitment and undying gratitude for the brave service and commitment that is required by all veterans. Next, I'd like to welcome Councilmember John Mark Jennings to discuss additional community programs that were introduced this year to show our gratitude. This year, Laguna Niguel took the opportunity to get even further involved in celebrating our veterans. One of our new programs allowed residents to order commemorative yard signs and display them on their property. These signs were meant to celebrate our remarkable veterans and ensure that everyone knew that a proud veteran lives here. The city provided the signs and the community provided their passion by ordering, delivering, and displaying those signs as a show of our gratitude and our thanks. We've also honored veterans by providing them preferred parking at City Hall and Sea Country Community Center, along with a dedicated reserve seat in City Council Chambers for our prisoners of war and those missing in action. Another new campaign this year is hashtag your hometown hero. This social media campaign was put into place to acknowledge our military veterans online. It allowed residents and members of surrounding communities to get involved by posting on Instagram and Facebook by including the hashtag Laguna Niguel thanks. That included in both their post about Veterans Day and for their military service. This campaign is a simple yet profound way to honor our military veterans right here in our hometown and has been a great way to get our younger residents involved. It is critical that our future generations learn the history of Veterans Day and continue to remember and share its rich history for generations to come. Now I'd like to welcome Council Member Sandy Rains to share the important history of what Veterans Day means to all of us. In the United States, Veterans Day is observed on November 11th each year. The significance of this date is meant to honor the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, which signaled the end of World War I on November 11, 1918. The date was originally known as Armistice Day. In 1954, after World War II and the Korean War, President Dwight D. Eisenhower officially changed the name of the holiday from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. In 1968, the Uniformed Holidays Bill was passed by Congress, which temporarily moved the celebration of the fourth Monday in October. The law went into effect in 1971. However, in 1975, Gerald Ford signed a new law 
which returned the annual observance of Veterans Day to the original date of November 11th due to its historical significance. November 11th commemorates all who have served and are currently serving in the United States Armed Forces. It also celebrates veterans of all wars, both living and deceased. Regardless of the day of the week that it falls on, because the act of protecting our freedoms doesn't cater to a specific weekday or weekend. The restoration of the observance of Veterans Day to November 11th not only preserved the historical significance of the date, but it also helps us to focus attention on the important purpose of the day, that being to celebrate and honor American veterans for their patriotism, love of our country, and willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. Great Britain, France, Australia, and Canada also commemorate veterans of World War I and World War II on or near November 11th. In Laguna Niguel, we observe Veterans Day as a tribute to our citizens who made the bold decision to defend our nation and its way of life by serving in the armed forces of the United States of America. I thank the Laguna Niguel community for your ongoing support of all veterans and ask that you please help us to carry forth this tradition far into the future, especially on Veterans Day. Thank you, Sandy. We are fortunate to have Sergeant, United States Army, World War II, Jim Vanchak to recount his memories while serving. Jim Vanchak joined the United States Army in 1946. After completing his basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, he was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division and left for Japan to join the U.S. Occupation Forces in Tokyo. His unit worked under General MacArthur's command to demilitarize and rebuild Japan. Sergeant Van Schack was sent to the 8th Army Special Services. Jim Van Schack received the World War II Victory Medal and the Army of Occupation Medal, Japan. In 2019, he was chosen as Veteran of the Year, presented to him by the Honorable William P. Bro, California Assemblyman, 73rd District, with a California Legislature Assembly Resolution. Today, Jim Van Schack is presenting a video that he produced on the 1945 to 1952 occupation of Japan and the Tokyo War Crimes Trials. Please welcome Jim Van Schack. What happened on December 7th is important because it carries, literally carries through. MacArthur was a terribly important part of all of this. He was a guy, literally, that, that, that changed Japan. There are people who like MacArthur and there are people who don't like him, but what he did was something nobody else has ever done.
all of those places in the little triangle were places literally where they had troops or they occupied or they had control of the government. Some of it was controlled by Japan, the pink, but the other was actually occupied. And as a result, there was nothing left. Australia and, and uh, uh, the south part of New Guinea and uh, a couple of other small islands and that was it. They pretty much had everything. And then everything turned around and went the other way. But it took us about three years to turn it around. That General MacArthur was the supreme commander of the troops in the Pacific. This guy, he was uh, a terribly important guy in terms of who was doing what during the war. He was the guy that invaded the Philippines, which was our property, not China, you know, not Burma, not India, but our property. And he's the guy we ultimately tried there and executed. The last sea battle of any consequence was the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So while these guys are going north and they're, the Japanese are trying to reinforce themselves coming south, then the sea battle started. So they are all concurrent. Kamikaze was an important part. That's where most of their destruction came as far as our ships were concerned. Uh, the battle damage mainly was from them. I think that's a Princeton. It was our small carrier, and it was sunk. But uh, they didn't. They didn't get uh, any of the really important. That's the largest ship in the Japanese Navy, and it was dumped. It was a kamikaze.
Now this is where it really got rough. And there were uh, Filipino civilians that were fighting along with our guys. And as I said, they, they, uh, the general tried to get his guys to leave, but there were about 20,000. Uh, they were like Marines, uh, Japanese Marines, and they refused to leave. And as a result, they came in and destroyed the city. Now that's hand-to-hand -hand stuff. Here's some of the destruction. I mean, literally set off bombs, burned everything that they couldn't blow up. It was pretty tough. I missed all of this by a year. <laughs> it was, thank God. But isn't it, you, the city was actually a beautiful city. They just absolutely destroyed it. This was an interesting thing. They had uh, an island, which is very, very small, but highly fortified. And they had no idea that we could land airborne troops on there, but we did. And that's what this is. There were thousands and thousands of prisoners because most all of our people were still there that were part of MacArthur's uh, entourage. And as a result, they were gonna kill them. So we knew we had to get there in a hurry. And it was a real, real uh, rush, rush type of thing to get up there before they killed them all. had two more bases to take. They had to get places to fly airplanes from. And that's why Iwo Jima was this tiny little island and lost a lot of people there. But it was key to bombing. They had an internal battle when Hirohito said he uh, wanted to capitulate. A group of his generals decided he was they weren't going to let him. They had a battle inside the in his uh, uh, home, and they tried to find a tape that he, or not a tape but a recording that he made that was to go out on on, on the uh, on the air to the public. And a lot of people got killed. And the ones that didn't get killed, killed themselves, the guys who tried to overthrow Hirohito. So that was a major deal. There's Hall C, there's Nimitz. So both of them are standing there. The grand climax of three and a half years of grueling fighting is reached as members of America's historic 7th Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division enter Tokyo. And General Chase congratulates Private Davis, first GI in the Jap capital. With the precision of a well-oiled machine, the occupation rolls into the city. The children have, at least, been taught the correct signals. No chances are taken, however. Full battle equipment is the order of the day. Appropriately, the regiment which fought under Custer adds luster to its record in this historic moment. The 
hour for which all America waited and prayed approaches as General MacArthur's car enters the American Embassy ground and the Allied commander is greeted by General Chase. Signal Corps and newsreel cameras record the impressive but simple ceremony by which the United States becomes undisputed master of a ruthless foe. In General MacArthur's words, this is the payoff. Pearl Harbor is avenged. The emperor came out into the public. It was the first time he'd done that. The Japanese people, when he drove down the street, had to, had to either turn their back or, or put their head on the ground. They gave him not to look at him. He was that kind of, of person. MacArthur, of course, knew that, but he also knew that he had to humanize him, and he did. And that was part of that photograph. It was the first time he'd ever been photographed with anybody like that. And he, nobody touched him. They told, they went in and warned him, MacArthur, that, that the emperor won't, doesn't want to shake your hand, won't shake your hand. And that's the very first thing he did. And he put his hand out and the emperor looked at his hand and, <laughs> and he put it out and shook it. Well, that's what made him human, literally. From that point on, You see a lot of guys in uniforms. They're the only clothes they had. We just made them take all the insignias and stuff off and they wore them until uh, they could get clothes. A lot of them were still wearing them when I left there. But they had to come from all those countries you saw in the beginning, oh, they were everywhere. Some of them didn't know the war was over, literally. She uh, broadcast to the troops. We had we had uh, radios, and and she broadcast us, and uh, did a lot of ha a lot of harm, a lot of damage to people. She, they they were spies. They had spies out. They'd give her information. They'd talk about people and, and units that we had opposing them, and they knew the names of people. It was just a, I guess, psychological warfare. A lot of the stuff was so antique, but there had thousands. I mean, you know, they've been building this thing for 30 years, and uh, they had tons and tons of stuff, but the equipment was pretty bad. But there was lots of it. If they weren't broken up or blown up, uh, they were dumped in the ocean. 
everybody, well, the Japanese all had swords. We, I never saw so many swords in my life. We had bunkers full of swords. It was, even the pilots that flew on their Navy ships had swords and wore them in the, in the plane. How they did it, I don't know. The big ships, they scuttled. Submarines, uh, they blew up the little ones or tore them up. But in this one place, there were 70 or 80 submarines. Well, that's what they did, is make scrap metal out of them. Airplanes, they dismantled a lot of them and, and uh, they used the parts for other things. They had about 8,000 aircraft that were left. This was a major thing too. A lot of the Japanese had taken money from other people and put it in their banks. Well, that all had to be straightened out. So the banks were all closed and About every four or five months, we had to change our money. We, we printed our own occupation money. But when the Japanese got it and started spending it, then we, we'd change it so they couldn't do that. Those are zeros that they were assembling. And these awful, you know, tanks are really not very very good, but they had lots of them. Then for one reason or another, we had parades. I was in one of them. It was, it was uh, winter time and we had our overcoats on. We had a march for seven miles. That was, that was, uh, was a circuit from our place all the way through the city and then back. But we paraded on the Imperial palace grounds, that's where this is. Oh, actually, when I first got there, they were, they were um, warning us that Korea was the next place. And we started training for the Korean War. That's what these scenes are. So that all took place in Japan, the training. Along with everything else that we did, we did that too. That's me with a cigarette in my mouth. It's an 81 millimeter mortar. There's Mount Fuji in the background. These were a, 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 a practice well, training in the mountains. Between the 1930s and 1940s, Japan sends troops to the Chinese mainland, across Southeast Asia, and into the Pacific Islands to engage in warfare that ultimately leaves tens of millions of people dead. On September 2nd, 1945, Japan signs the instrument of surrender to end the war. The Allied powers appoint General Douglas MacArthur as Supreme Commander and quickly occupy all of Japan. Former Japanese cabinet ministers and military leaders are arrested. In November of the same year, leaders from Nazi Germany, Japan's ally in the war, go on trial in Nuremberg. In January 1946, using Nuremberg as a reference, Supreme Commander MacArthur enacts a charter for the Tokyo trial that outlines three categories of war crimes. These are crimes against peace, conventional war crimes, 
and crimes against humanity. 28 former Japanese leaders are then charged as Class A war criminals. The Tokyo trial begins. Thank you, Jim. To all the veterans out there today, here in our community, throughout our state, across the country and around the globe, we sincerely thank you for your service, sacrifice and dedication. We are forever indebted to you and your families and will continue to honor you through our programs and services here in the remarkable city of Laguna Niguel. As we conclude today's program, I would like to thank all of those who have graciously contributed to making this presentation possible. Veteran Sergeant, United States Army, World War II, Jim Van Shack. Girl Scout, Katie Schaefer. Boy Scouts, Dennis Mulvaney, Donna Mulvaney. Mayor Lori Davies. Mayor Pro Tem, Fred Minigar. Laguna Niguel City Council members, John Mark Jennings and Sandy Rains. City Manager, Tammy Letourneau. Deputy City Manager, Justin Martin. City of Laguna Niguel Parks and Recreation Department. American Legion Post 281. And finally, for the veterans, thank you for bravely doing what you're called to do so we can safely do what we're free to do. We are forever indebted. God bless you and God bless America.